Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining me. My name is David James Sullivan. Uh, I'm a music producer, as Connor said. Um, I've played with bands like uh, Real Menace, The Chapter House, Still, Time Olive, um, Matisse. My music has featured in movies and documentaries and TV things all over the world. Um, and as he said, I'm also an amateur uh, historian and genealogist. I kicked off the uh, restoration of Fort Camden here in uh, Crosshaven in Cork with my friend um, Vincent Farr. And uh, so this is the very first time I've ever been asked to speak about my research. And for that, I would really sincerely like to thank uh, Jacqueline McStay and Connor Doyle for inviting me to make my very first presentation to such a prestigious um, unit. Um, my presentation is going to end quite abruptly because, of course, it's going to end with the wreck. And at the moment, the wreck is in quite a, a, a vulnerable location, and I don't really want to talk too much about it. Um, the slides, there's a lot of them. There's uh, 49 slides. Uh, the references, uh, where the information comes from, is in blue. Uh, for anyone who isn't colorblind, I am colorblind. So I'll begin. My, my, oh, why did that not work? So my um, research began really in 1987. This is my wonderful grandmother, uh, Elizabeth Sullivan. She was a school teacher and uh, an amateur historian. And I used to spend every summer holiday with her in Drimalig in West Cork. Um, she used to drum all sorts of stories into us, crazy stories. Uh, I have to say it is quite an odd family. Um, a lot of her research was into what we call the Trenwith legacy. And uh, this was a, an enormous legacy that was left to the family. And uh, she used to, she was an avid letter writer, so she would write to um, people and uh, exchange notes as it were. So I'm going to let one of the letters describe to you what this was, the Trenwith legacy. Uh, this is an amateur historian called Richard Duclo. He lived in Bandon in West Cork and he often wrote to my grandmother. And in this uh, particular 10 page letter, he describes the legacy thus. Um, it was in St. Ives in Cornwall. The legacy was where all the Trenwits originated and it was supposed to be six and a half million and was then 119 years old. Six and a half million, whether uh, he was talking about a period in time of about uh, 1914, whether it was 1914 or 119 years earlier, uh, 1792, it's still an astronomical sum of money. I don't have it, by the way. Um, there were a lot of crazy sort of uh, folklore stories handed down. Uh, she used to tell us that we were Ulrich Sullivans and uh, there are many different branches. In fact, my grandmother divided the family up into four different branches that she felt were entitled to this colossal sum of money. Um, there's the Capali, you don't need to remember this, but there were the Capali Sullivans, the Tata Sullivans, the Rhine Desert Sullivans and the Harmons. And uh, most of these uh, strange stories, we all have the same story, more or less, in the family. For example, William Trenwood was knighted at Alihi's Mines for being good to the poor. So this comes from the Capalia Sullivans. And to begin with, there is no William Trenwith with a peerage. Uh, nobody uh, could have been knighted uh, Ali's mind because it didn't exist at this time. And uh, usually you didn't get knighted for being good to the poor. You got knighted for cutting their heads off. Um, so I think a lot of these stories are, they're using metaphors to describe uh, their stories to us. 
Um, another great story we have, all branches of the Sullivan family have this. Um, it's about a wealthy Sullivan, oh, sorry, wealthy Trenwith man who comes back and he visits his um, relations back in Ireland. Uh, he gets down on one knee and he presses a sovereign into the hand of one of the young children and he says, they all call me John Trenwith, but my real name is John Sullivan. Uh, another story we all have is that uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie spent a night on Dursey Island on his way back from Culloden. Um, we have this story, the Reen Desert Sullivans have this story, the Capilea Sullivans have this story, the Islanders have this story, and it appears in print in a uh, book, The Coast of West Cork by Somerville Large. Um, in 1988, a uh, historian in Northern Ireland, Ronald Price, who is uh, related to us, compiled a history of the Thayla Sullivans. That's my particular branch of the Sullivans. And uh, in it, there is uh, a problem. And that is that we don't know who my fifth great grandfather is. We know who my fourth great grandfather is. His name was Michael Sullivan. And we don't know who his father was. So uh, Ronald compiled uh, a, a selection of really odd phrases and sentences. And it's about all we know about Michael's father. I've selected two here. Michael's father could something six horses. Uh, this phrase was written down by a historian called Paddy O'Keefe, but we can't read his handwriting, so we don't know what this word is. So uh, Michael's father could something six horses. I once asked my father what uh, use there would be in West Cork for somebody who could do something with six horses, and he said, there was nothing. So that sort of led me in the direction of military. And in the uh, Austrian armies, the cavalry were towing cannon using six horses. So I think this is a military term. It was a huge skill. I actually saw them doing this uh, at a, a pageant in London a number of years ago. Um, so it's something they've retained to up until modern times. Um, another very odd story is this one. And this is really what kicks it all off. One further story told about Michael relates to his father lost his land, lost his farm as a result of trading with the French. And that he later fought a duel with the new owner, losing a couple of toes as a result. So one would think that it would be quite easy to find uh, a Sullivan man who had access to a ship so he could deal with the French uh, and who uh, fought a duel. Well, not so easy, really. Um, so everyone in the family before me seems to have lost their shirts trying to find uh, the trend with the legacy. So I went in a different direction. And I decided to try and find out who Michael's father was, try and prove it. And to that end, I have been unsuccessful. I, I, I have not proved who Michael's father was. As I said, we are called the Sullivan Urig, and we used to proudly walk around West Cork telling everybody that we were Urig Sullivans, and we had no idea whatsoever what Urig meant until very recently. Um, and I'll come back to that. This is our crest, and it's different from other Sullivan crests because it has a robin on the top, and he's got uh, a myrtle in his beak. Uh, the Reen Desert Sullivan Siobhan's branch of the family, they say that this is Jacobite, and uh, we think that it's Masonic, so it's probably a mixture between the two. So, if we go back along my direct line, 
the oldest date we have is 1777. And that is the marriage between Mary Vickery and Michael Sullivan that we spoke about earlier. Um, the Vickeries uh, have a number of trees. The earliest was made up by Walter Kingston in uh, 1905. I think this is a newer version, it was re-edited by Maud Vickery. And if you can see that, it says, son of MacFinnan Dove of Dreen, of the Dumboy Castle family of O'Sullivan's, lived at Teda Farm for five generations. Um, I'm going to get rid of this middle sentence because uh, the Dunboy Castle family of O'Sullivan's went extinct in the early 1600s, so we can't really be uh, related to them or descended from them. But we will come back to this piece about uh, the son of MacFinnan Dove. So we're looking for a Sullivan man in West Cork who has access to a ship. I'm going to tell you now the Irish story. And the Irish story is about a man called Morty Og or Muirte Og. Uh, Muirte meaning mariner or captain and Og meaning young. So really we're just saying the young captain. So Morty Og lived in this tiny little cottage uh, outside Iris, and uh, he had a ship, and the ship was called the Jutel. In all accounts, uh, both fictional and non-fictional, his ship is called the Jutel. And Morty Oak, at some point in his life, uh, had a falling out with the local land agent, John Puxley. John Puxley lived here, not quite. Um, the, he lived in the tower at the uh, right of this picture. Uh, the rest of the castle was actually an extension that was added by the family when they um, became uh, prosperous due to the copper mining in Allahys. Uh, we don't really know why these two men uh, fell out. Uh, there is a story that John Puxley murdered the young nephews of Morty Og, and therefore Morty Og, uh, decided to challenge him to a duel. Um, whatever the reason, he challenged John Puxley to a duel, and Puxley responded, it does not become an English gentleman to duel with an Irish papist. So Morty Oak took things into his own hands and uh, he went to a place called Oakmount and he waited there on the second Sunday in Lent at Darby Harrington's Forge and he waited for uh, John Puxley and his entourage to arrive. They were on their way to a church service on the other side of uh, Castletown Bear. Uh, not a lot is known about this uh, altercation, but both men uh, pulled their weapons and Morty Oak shot John Puxley dead. So the English decided they were going to do something about this Morty Oak, and so they sent uh, a raiding party of 30 well-trained, well-equipped soldiers under the command of uh, Lieutenant Appleton. And they arrived in Dumboy and they marched over the Oran Mountains and down to Morty Oak's house. Now there's a problem with this story because Morty Oak was in this house with his wife and his child and his nurse and 18 members of the crew from the ship. So when I show this uh, 
cottage to my father, he said, they must have gone on very well together. That aside, the house was surrounded and uh, torrential rain, guns were misfiring on all sides and there was a huge gun battle. Uh, Morty Og negotiated for the uh, safe passage of his wife and child and nurse and then he released the crew of the ship one at a time until there were three men left in the house. Uh, John O'Connell himself and little John Sullivan and then they burst through the door firing in all directions. Morty Og made it up to a bank when he was about to jump over it a shot rang out and he was killed with a ball through his heart. The ship was behind the house and so after they had brought his body over, back over the Orr Mountain to Dunboy where they buried it, they sent the kingship around to commandeer uh, the Jutel, but his crew had sunk it, so the English set fire to the ship and burned it to the waterline. They then returned to Dunboy, dug up his body, lashed it to the rudder of the ship, and they towed it back to Cork, where they cut his head off and they spiked it on the south gate of Cork City. And the stone that his head was actually spiked on is at the, on the top of the steps of the Beamish and Crawford building. And I'm delighted to say the Beamish and Crawford building has been beautifully renovated and the stone is still in pride of place. So that's the end of the Irish story of Morty Oak. And now I'm going to tell you the English story. The English story is about a man called Sir John William O'Sullivan, and they called him the Fat Seminarian. And he was born in Kerry in a place called Capanacush Castle in Temple No. And uh, Siobhan from the Reen Desert Sullivans will know that it took us two years to find this castle despite the fact that we were nearly walking over it. Um, to be honest, it is a very well arranged pile of stones in a forest. So he was born in this castle and again to poor Catholic parents. And apparently they scraped every penny they had together and they sent him to Rome to train to become a Catholic priest. Um, obviously, that didn't go too well uh, because he became a childminder to this man, the Marshal of Malbois. So in 1739, the Marshal de Malbois brought his uh, childminder to Corsica, and this was the first time he experienced warfare. However, he showed such a great flair for guerrilla warfare that uh, he caught the attention of this man. And this is Charles Edward Stewart, or I think we probably know him better as Bonnie Prince Charles. Um, he was the son of the pretender. He was a Stuart and the Stuarts were Roman Catholic and they had been ousted by the Protestant Hanoverians. And so they were living in exile in Europe. Um, at this time, the English army were fighting multiple wars in Europe. So Charles Edward Stuart decided that now was the time to attack England and take his throne back. So on the 5th of June, 1745, Charles Edward Stuart and these men, uh, they're called the Seven Men of Mordet, boarded a ship called the Jutili, and they headed off to attack England. 
Um, our childminder has been promoted, if you see at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, he has now become Colonel John William O'Sullivan. And now I will attempt to squash the entire Jacobite rebellion into uh, five minutes. The prince landed in Scotland and he raised his standard and the clans uh, rallied to his cause. And when they had enough men together, they took Edinburgh and then they fought uh, a decisive battle in a place called Preston Pans. And now with the hardware they had uh, taken from the English and buoyed up about 8,000 men in total, they marched over the border into England and they began to take town after town as they moved further south. Now, as this is going on, uh, the prince is more or less promising these clans financial reward money. He can't dole out counties like the other ones because they're in exile, so they are paying cash. And so a ship called Lesera has been dispatched from France, loaded with silver and gold given to them by the Pope and by the King of France and the King of Spain, and in fact, by James himself. So this ship heads for Scotland and they're fighting their way down, uh, heading for Derby. The ship arrives and the ship is unduly unloaded by tribesmen. And then they discover that these clansmen were loyal to the English. So the Jacobites have basically lost their money. So there's a big meeting, war council held in Derby and uh, the Jacobites more or less decide that they have to retreat. Everyone except the Prince and Sullivan want to retreat, they wanted to carry on and take London. Now, Lord George Murray, a very strange story about him, he kind of joined the affray about halfway through, and he was one of the main uh, instigators for the retreat. And there was also a story of there being an army between London and Derby, which there wasn't. So anyway, the Jacobites running out of money, running out of food, running out of ammunition, uh, and running out of shoes, they begin to retreat back up towards Scotland. Uh, somewhere along the line, I think uh, it might have been Carlisle, they ordered the townspeople to hand over their shoes. So eventually they get up to uh, back into Scotland. But by this time, Cumberland has arrived back in England with the entire English army and 50 warships and they are well stocked and they were well rested and they march out of uh, Aberdeen uh, basically to confront the Jacobites. Jacobites eventually march on to uh, the fields of Culloden which incidentally uh, was chosen by our childminder Sullivan. First they're beaten and then they are massacred with uh, injured men being clubbed to death on the battlefield. So here the story gets really strange. John William Sullivan takes the reins of the prince's horse and he forces them from the field. And now they're on the run. And in the official story, uh, one of these ships came in and rescued the prince. We know the story about Flora MacDonald um, taking the prince and then jumping from Thatch Cottage to Thatch Cottage and the romantic story of the prince dressed up as Betty Burke 
and uh, all that good stuff. And then eventually, with their 50 ship blockade around uh, Scotland, one of these ships, because there are many, many different accounts, sailed in, took the prince, brought him back to uh, France. Uh, actually, uh, he died in Rome. Um, and he, he more or less ended up uh, uh, an alcoholic. And these, these are just some of the ships, the, the Les Heureux that we saw earlier on, the Hardy Mendant, the Prince of Conte, the Bologna, uh, and a ship called the Bien Trove, the, the, the Well Found. And at the very bottom there, you'll see there is an account of him being rescued by a neutral ship. So that's more or less the English story. And now I am going to tell you my story. And my story is about a man called John William Sullivan, and he has a title, and the title comes from the McCarthy side of his family, and it is called MacFin and Dove, which means the Black Knight. This John William Sullivan was born in a place called Dereen. So we're going to look at genealogy. This is the oldest letter we have in the family. And it was written in 1796 by an old man. This is Owen O'Sullivan, and he is remembering this. And he says, as you see on the bottom of the screen here, my mother's sister was married to Dermot O'Sullivan, eldest son of Daniel O'Sullivan, Lord of Dunkerran. And her son Cornelius, as I understand, was with the pretender in Scotland in the year 1745. So if you look at my little graph, you can see Owen is over here on the right hand side. His mother is Joanna and Joanna's sister is Catherine. And Catherine married Dermot Sullivan Moore. This matches McCarthy trees, the Sullivan trees and the O'Connell trees. So this is quite correct. The difference between my story and everybody else's story is if you look at the top up here, you can see Ellen McCarthy Ray, and you can see Derby McCarthy Moore. And the joining of these two dynasties created one of the most powerful families in Europe. These were incredibly wealthy, incredibly powerful families. Uh, an interesting little twist to this is if you look again on the left hand side you can see that Catherine's sister Julia married the Reverend Thomas Palmer and the Reverend Thomas Palmer was a Protestant clergyman who had in, was linked in some way to Anne Hyde the wife of uh, James II but he was also the brother-in-law of the notorious Barbara Palmer, who was uh, mistress to Charles II. So they're very close to royalty over here already. So, um, Dunkerran. This is Dunkerran Castle, and that is my father standing in front of it. And if I could prove uh, that Michael's father was uh, John William Sullivan, then he would be MacFin and Dove as well, probably claim that the castle. So Dunkerran was torn down by O'Sullivan himself to prevent it from falling into the hands of uh, Cromwell's agent, William Petty. And Dunkerran is within viewing distance of Captain Cush Castle that we saw earlier. So I think it's very unlikely that they would have pulled down their own castle and allowed Captain Cush Castle to remain standing. And in fact, I've read an account that Captain Cush Castle was actually destroyed in three different wars. And after the third war, they didn't rebuild it. So I feel that Captain Cush was long since demolished before anybody. Uh, recently was born in it. So in fact, 
the Sullivans have moved across Kenmare Bay and they took a lease in 1697 for a place called Doreen. Doreen today is an absolutely magnificent paradise. And there, O'Sullivan built this beautiful house, slated house. And through Catherine McCarthy that we saw earlier, he received the title MacFinnan Dove. And here you can see uh, just a, a clip from his uh, last will and testament. And he said, I, Dermot O'Sullivan, MacFinnan Dove of Drina Verig. And here we have Verig, where the O'Sullivan or the Sullivan Verigs. And it's simply the name of the mountain that overlooks Dunkerran on the other side of the Kenmare Bay. So if you look at the second little uh, paragraph, in 1733, in the Dublin Penny Journal, his son, Morty, the captain, uh, is now using the title as well. He's calling himself MacFinnan Sullivan. Back to genealogy. Um, John William Sullivan of Doreen married Hanora O'Connell. And Hanora was from the famous O'Connells of Derry Nam. Now, believe me when I tell you, this is an absolutely simplified uh, tree. The O'Connells had dozens and dozens of children. So I have isolated out three. If you look to the left, you can see that Honora O'Connell's brother, Morgan, had a son, Daniel. And Daniel is standing in pride of place in the middle of O'Connell Street in Dublin. He was one of our greatest politicians in my estimate. Um, if you look at the other side, you can see uh, Hanora had a sister, Abigail O'Connell. And Abigail was a chamberlain to Mary Theresa of Austria. So you're kind of beginning to see the sort of level that these families are moving in. Now, one of the most uh, fascinating little pieces about Abigail here is that if you look, she died in 1767, and so did her three children. So I did a bit of investigating. This is Mary Theresa, Empress of Austria. And in 1767, the royal household was hit by smallpox. Mary Theresa herself contracted it and she survived. Her sister, Maria Josephia of Bavaria, wasn't so lucky, she died. Uh, so did Mary Theresa's daughter, Maria Josephia. Um, Mozart caught smallpox in 1767. Uh, fortunately for us, he survived. But sadly, Abigail and her three children all died of smallpox. Her husband, uh, Dennis, didn't remarry, and he went on to become the mayor of Prague. So our John William Sullivan built his house outside the Shelburne estate. Now, if anybody is familiar with the Bear Peninsula, the Shelburne estate, the border, uh, runs down the middle of the road from Castletown Bear to Wyrees. It follows the river under what they call Drogheda Nagadi, the Bridge of the Thieves, out into the sea. John William Sullivan built his house outside that, not where that little cottage you saw earlier on was. There is a tiny bit of evidence in Featherston Hawes' account of this, written 150 years later. Um, and he says, we are informed 
uh, that Puxley and Richard Broder were at John Sullivan's house at Coolock. So we know that there was a John Sullivan uh, house in Coolock. This man was a career soldier. He fought for Mary Teresa. She decorated him. She gave him a, a richly decorated sword, which, believe it or not, was hanging on the wall of a pub in Castletown Bear until quite recently. No doubt somebody realised its value. Um, so, a career soldier, and in 1745, he was fighting for Lord Clare's uh, Regiment of the Irish Brigade. And it's a great story, this. The, uh, the English and the French were lined up, 10,000 men on each side. The French were losing the field. The order was given for the Irish Brigade to engage, and they charged down the mountain uh, into the English lines, causing it to shatter and the French cavalry were able to break through and turn the battle in France's favor. I think this is a painting of the King and uh, General Sachs uh, congratulating or thanking the, the Irish Brigade after the, the battle. I might be wrong there. Anyway, Battle of Fontenoy, 1745. While all this is going on, preparation is going on for the Jacobite Rebellion. Now, if you remember, I was looking for an Irishman, a Sullivan, who had some sort of link to a ship. And I trawled through the Archive Nationale de France, and I found four ships that were associated with Irish men at this time. One was an absolutely colossal man of war called the Elizabeth, huge ship, uh, quite old. Two ships were the Mars and the Boulogne. They were frigates, 30 gun frigates, and they were being built at this time. So they were being built in Nantes uh, in 1744. And beside them was a little brigantine, two master ship, weighed 150 tons, and she was 23 meters long. I like the idea of the three ships kind of lined up, being built together, but it's pure fantasy on my part. All these three, these four ships were associated with Irishmen. So on the 5th of June, 1745, we've seen this before, Charles Edward Stewart and these seven men of Mordet, one of them is Sullivan, boarded the Jutel and they headed for Scotland. The story is going to be a little bit different. They rendezvoused in a place called Belle with the massive man of war, the Elizabeth. And the Elizabeth had on board uh, 80 soldiers from the Irish Brigade, artillery, uh, muskets, broadswords, ammunition, food. She had everything one would need for a rebellion. Um, scholars of uh, the Jacobite Rebellion, I don't know if they get the same feeling as, as, as I do from reading all these different accounts, but I think there was a lot of spies or, uh, I don't know, the English seem to know a lot about what was going on. So whether it was chance or uh, betrayal, I don't know. The Elizabeth and the Dutilly were spotted by a ship called the Lion, uh, captained by Percy Brett. She was a 58 gun uh, warship. And in, as depicted in this fabulous painting here by Dominic Serez, uh, the lion engaged. 
So the lion and the Elizabeth lined up and they pummeled each other into splinters for five hours until both ships were completely unmanageable. And finally, Percy Brett broke away and the two ships sailed away. Uh, was fairly sorry looking states, I would imagine. So the Dutilly came up alongside the Elizabeth and they discovered that 57 men had been killed, 175 men had been injured, the captain was dead, and the ship was completely unmanageable. So Dutilly and the Prince and the seven men of Modus had to head off to Scotland on their own. The Dutilly did not engage in this episode. Um, and we'll come back to that later on because it kind of shows just that how important the prince was to this uh, entire affair. So as we know, the Dutilly went to Scotland and dropped off the prince and the Jacobite hierarchy. And we know the story. They went off and fought the Jacobite rebellion. We're now going to follow the ship. The Dutilly then sailed back to Europe and it sailed into Amsterdam Harbour and it was handed over to uh, a Dutch crew. So if you think about that, you have, they went to all the expense of building this beautiful modern ship, launching it, they put a prince into it, they go off to Scotland, and then they come back and they just hand it over to a Dutch crew. Odd. I believe that this was a mechanism to obtain a neutral flag. So the Jacobite rebellion is going on. Now, the two huge frigates, 30 gun frigates, the Mars and the Blown, ultra modern warships are in Nantes. Whatever their original plan with these two ships, I don't know, but the Mars and the Blown were loaded again with silver and gold from the Pope, from the King of France, from the King of Spain, from James again, and packed with money, the two ships set sail for Scotland to uh, pay the clans. However, while the two ships were on their way to Scotland, the Battle of Culloden had taken place. And as we know, a lot of the clans were wiped out. So when the two ships arrived in Scotland, there was hardly anyone left to pay. Um, so the Mars and the Boulogne became a sort of a rescue mission. They were hugely powerful. Um, forgive me if there's anybody Scottish watching. They, uh, they arrived in a place called Loch Nanuv. And uh, they took on board the entire Jacobite hierarchy and they blasted their way out. It's one of the best uh, seafaring accounts I've ever read of a sea battle was these two French ships blasting their way out through the English blockade and they headed back to France. This is an account from the London Gazette uh, between the 10th and the 14th of June, 1746. And it says, we hear from Nantes that on the sixth instant, the Mars and the Blown, two ships which some time ago were sent to Scotland with supplies for the pretender sun return thither. They were attacked in the bay of Loch Nanuv, forgive me, um, by English frigates and two English sloops, which after an engagement of five hours were obliged to retire. Several passengers on board uh, arrived on the, sorry, several passengers arrived on board the above vessel and amongst others, Lord John Drummond, Messieurs Sheridan and Sullivan, 
Lockheed Jr., the Duke of Perth died in his passage. They brought no news of the pretender's son. They brought no news of the pretender's son. So the entire Jacobite hierarchy got onto these two massive warships and they went back to France and they more or less left the prince to his own devices. Um, another interesting little piece about all this is that when they arrived back in France, all the money was gone. The ships were empty. So this is me in the National Library of Ireland. I went to read a letter called the Griffith Letter. And it's written by uh, the Reverend Valentine Griffith um, in 1852. And what this is, is uh, interviews he carried out with elderly parishioners in the parish of, uh, parish of Glen Columkill. And they are recounting stories that their parents told them. And the story goes like this. The people of Glen Columkill woke up one morning and there was a stranger living amongst them. He was, I'm reading from the letter here, a stranger of remarkable fine person. They thought it odd to see his knees bare, implying that his kilt was too short, that it was kind of modern fashions. His reserve was excessive. He had a manservant with him. He was tall, he was handsome. And every morning he would wake up and he would walk out along the peninsula at Glen Columbkill and he would look out at the sea. And he did this for a number of weeks. And uh, then one morning they woke up and as you see, see here, he went as he came without any sort of previous notice. So what I think has happened is Sullivan has returned on the Boulogne to Nantes. He's made his way to Amsterdam. He has collected the Dutilly, flying a neutral Dutch flag, and he's made his way around to Glen Cullum Kill, where he has rescued the prince. He then sailed down the west coast of Ireland, and they stopped at Dursey Island. Now, I'm not the only person who thinks that this is where Charles Edward Stuart escaped to. The English army also thought he escaped there because a number of weeks later, they passed through the town of Glen Cullum Kill with a painting of the prince. And they went from house to house asking the people if they had ever seen this man before. And it was the first time the people of Glen Cullum Kill realized who it was that had been living amongst them. So when we see this in my grandmother's letters, Mary Ann Trennell's father was knighted at Alhe's Mines. Dursey Island is just beside Alhe's. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, that it's quite possible that uh, John William was knighted by Charles Edward Stewart that night on Dursey Island. He was knighted by the Stuarts. There are, are uh, documents in the Stuart manuscripts to back it up. So Lieutenant Appleton is sent to deal with this John Sullivan. This was written by one of the soldiers uh, who was with General Appleton on the night they went to uh, deal with Sullivan. 
And there, this is one of my breakthrough moments. In the uh, account, he says, it was a strange wild place close to the sea amidst rocks and bogs and utter desolation. Near it stood the wreck of a roofless church and yet older ruins of some Danish pirate's nest. The shadowy form of the brigantine was visible through the gray sheets of falling rain at anchor in the harbor. This was on the 4th of May, 1754 at 3 a.m. in the morning. So at 3 a.m. in the morning, we know where the ship was. But this is Kuluk. It's a different place. I've walked it. I've gone from Dunboy over the mountain and down into Kuluk. But once, uh, a few years ago, I walked these lands with the present owner, Timothy Harrington. And as we descended into Kuluk, I said to him, was there ever a church on the right-hand side? And quite dumbfounded, he turned around and he said to me, how did you know that? And I said, it's seen it in this account. And he said, there was a church. Uh, they used the stone to build a school in the nearby village of Iris. So there was a church here. There are old sheds. Uh, I don't know how you'd know they were Dutch, but there are old sheds on the left. If the house was straight in front of you here, you can see the sea behind it. So everything here matches to this place, Kuluk. And this is where the church stood. In this beautiful drawing done by artist Karen Leyland, she took some artistic license and she sank the ship a day too early. This is the deck of John William Sullivan. And they took his body over and as we said before, they towed it to Cork and put it on a spike. So it's the end of my story of the Jutili. This is her here. And nothing more is heard of it until quite recently, she appears on this website, the Irish Rex Online. And if you look at the fourth ship down in this list, you have 1754, the Jutel, this is the Irish pronunciation of Jutili, a smuggling brig, so she's been somewhat demoted. Uh, she has eight swivel guns, ballast, and she was scuttled at Klein Derry. Now, I have never found a place called Klein Derry. Perhaps it exists. But I think what this means is that it was scuttled by the Doreen clan, meaning the Sullivans scuttled the ship. Um, this information comes from an earlier publication by uh, Dr. Edward Burke, uh, his book, uh, Shipwrecks of the Irish Coast. And what's really interesting about this is that the ship is no longer in Kinmare Bay, where Kulak is. The ship, as you can see on the top left-hand corner, is in Bantry Bay. So, I developed a theory that the family, the Sullivan family, are trying to preserve the wreck. So, what we did, this is my son, Noma, uh, and with the help of uh, Mark Cochran, we droned all the places in Bantry where we knew there was a Sullivan house. So what happened here is that John William Sullivan's house was burned down to the ground in Kulak, and the family then kind of moved <laughs> towards more civilized <laughs> areas of Bantry Bay, and the houses are spread out along the coast of Bantry. And we droned every single one of them. And when we saw uh, something of interest, 
we would dress up and wade out into the mock and uh, we investigated every shopping trolley and BMX bike between Bantry and Alahis. And yes, we did find a wreck. And this wreck is 23 meters long. Uh, the Jutel or the Jutili was 23 meters long. This wreck doesn't have any ballast, which is quite odd. It has been placed where it is, it has been put where it is, and it lies right in front of the house that belonged to John Williams' daughter. The ballast, we droned Kulak Bay, and there is a strange mound in sort of where you would expect them to have put a ship. And we think that it is possible that this is the ballast that they removed from the ship and then towed it out of Kenmare Bay and into Bantry Bay and put it where it lies today in front of his daughter's house. And so that is the end of my uh, presentation. I would sincerely like to thank Jacqueline McStay and Connor Doyle for inviting me. It was the first time I've ever done this. Um, and if anybody is interested, I have a page of all the references uh, and places where a lot of this information came from. And uh, if anybody has a question for me, I will do my very best to uh, answer.